Far from the Madding Crowd by Thomas Hardy. Chapter forty. On Casterbridge Highway. For a considerable time the woman walked on. Her steps became feebler, and she strained her eyes to look far upon the naked road, now indistinct amid the penumbra of night. At length her onward walk dwindled to the merest totter, and she opened a gate within which was a haystack. Underneath this she sat down, and presently slept. When the woman awoke it was to find herself in the depths of a moonless and starless night. A heavy, unbroken crust of cloud stretched across the sky, shutting out every speck of heaven, and a distant halo which hung over the town of Casterbridge was visible against the black concave, the luminosity appearing the brighter by its great contrast with the circumscribing darkness. Towards this weak, soft glow the woman turned her eyes. "'If only I could get there,' she said. "'Meet him the day after to-morrow. God help me.' Perhaps I shall be in my grave before then. A manor-house clock from the far depths of shadow struck the hour one in a small, attenuated tone. After midnight the voice of a clock seems to lose in breadth as much as in length, and to diminish its sonorousness to a thin falsetto. Afterwards a light, two lights, arose from the remote shade, and grew larger, a carriage rolled along the road and passed the gate. It probably contained some late diners out. The beam from one lamp shone for a moment upon the crouching woman, and threw her face into vivid relief. The face was young in the groundwork, old in the finish. The general contours were flexuous and childlike, but the finer lineaments had begun to be sharp and thin. The pedestrian stood up apparently with revived determination, and looked around. The road appeared to be familiar to her, and she carefully scanned the fence as she slowly walked along. Presently there became visible a dim white shape. It was another milestone. She drew her fingers across its face to feel the marks. Two more,' she said. She leant against the stone as a means of rest for a short interval, then bestirred herself, and again pursued her way. For a slight distance she bore up bravely, afterwards flagging as before. This was beside a lone copsewood, wherein heaps of white chips strewn upon the leafy ground showed that woodmen had been faggoting and making hurdles during the day. Now there was not a rustle, not a breeze, not the faintest clash of twigs to keep her company. The woman looked over the gate, opened it, and went in. Close to the entrance stood a row of faggots, bound and unbound, together with stakes of all sizes. For a few seconds the wayfarer stood, with that tense stillness which signifies itself not to be the end, but merely the suspension of a previous motion. Her attitude was that of a person who listens, either to the external world of sound, or to the imagined discourse of thought. A close criticism might have detected signs proving that she was intent on the latter alternative. Moreover, as was shown by what followed, she was oddly exercising the faculty of invention upon the speciality of the clever Jacquet Droz, the designer of automatic substitutes for human limbs. By the aid of the Casterbridge Aurora, and by feeling with her hands, the woman selected two sticks from the heaps. These sticks were nearly straight, to the height of three or four feet, where each branched into a fork, like the letter Y. She sat down, snapped off the small upper twigs, and carried the remainder with her to the road. She placed one of these forks under each arm as a crutch, tested them, timidly threw her whole weight upon them, so little that it was, and swung herself forward. The girl had made for herself a material aid. The crutches answered well. The pat of her feet and the tap of her sticks upon the highway were all the sounds that came from the traveller now. She had passed the last milestone by a good long distance, and began to look wistfully towards the bank as if calculating upon another milestone soon. The crutches, though so very useful, had their limits of power. Mechanism only transfers labour, being powerless to supersede it, and the original amount of exertion was not cleared away. It was thrown into the body and arms. She was exhausted, and each swing forward became fainter. 
At last she swayed sideways and fell. Here she lay, a shapeless heap, for ten minutes and more. The morning wind began to boom dully over the flats and to move afresh dead leaves which had lain still since yesterday. The woman desperately turned round upon her knees, and next rose to her feet. Steadying herself by the help of one crutch, she essayed a step, then another, then a third, using the crutches now as walking sticks only. Thus she progressed till, descending Melstock Hill, another milestone appeared, and soon the beginning of an iron-railed fence came into view. She staggered across to the first post, clung to it, and looked around. The Casterbridge lights were now individually visible. It was getting towards morning, and vehicles might be hoped for, if not expected soon. She listened. There was not a sound of life, save that acme and sublimation of all dismal sounds the bark of a fox, its three hollow notes being rendered at intervals of a minute with the precision of a funeral bell. "'Less than a mile,' the woman murmured. "'No, more,' she added after a pause. "'The mile is only to the county hall, and my resting place is on the other side of Casterbridge. A little over a mile, and there I am.' After an interval she again spoke. Five or six steps to a yard. Six, perhaps. I have got to go seventeen hundred yards. A hundred times six. Six hundred. Seventeen times that. Oh, pity me, Lord. Holding to the rail, she advanced, thrusting one hand forward upon the rail, then the other, then leaning over it whilst she dragged her feet on beneath. This woman was not given to soliloquy, but extremity of feeling lessens the individuality of the weak, as it increases that of the strong. She said again in the same tone, "'I'll believe that the end lies five posts forward, and no further, and so gets strength to pass them.' This was a practical application of the principle that a half-feigned and fictitious faith is better than no faith at all. She passed five posts, and held on to the fifth. I'll pass five more by believing my long first spot is at the next fifth. I can do it. She passed five more. It lies only five further. She passed five more. But it is five further. She passed them. That stone bridge is the end of my journey, she said, when the bridge over the Froom was in view. She crawled to the bridge. During the effort, each breath of the woman went into the air, as if never to return again. "'Now for the truth of the matter,' she said, sitting down. "'The truth is that I have less than half a mile.' Self-beguilement with what she had known all the time to be false had given her strength to come over half a mile that she would have been powerless to face in the lump. The artifice showed that the woman, by some mysterious intuition, had grasped the paradoxical truth that blindness may operate more vigorously than prescience, and the short-sighted effect more than the far-seeing, that limitation and not comprehensiveness is needed for striking a blow. A half-mile now stood before the sick and weary woman like a stolid juggernaut. It was an impassive king of her world. The road here ran across Durnover Moor, open to the road on either side. She surveyed the wide space, the lights, herself, sighed and lay down against the guardstone of the bridge. Never was ingenuity exercised so sorely as the traveller here exercised hers. Every conceivable aid, method, stratagem, mechanism, by which these last desperate eight hundred yards could be overpassed by a human being unperceived, was resolved in her busy brain, and dismissed as impracticable. She thought of sticks, wheels, crawling, she even thought of rolling, but the exertion demanded by either of these latter two was greater than to walk erect. The faculty of contrivance was worn out. Hopelessness had come at last. No further, she whispered, and closed her eyes. From the stripe of shadow on the opposite side of the bridge, a portion of shade seemed to detach itself, and move into isolation upon the pale white of the road. It glided noiselessly towards the recumbent woman. 
she became conscious of something touching her hand. It was softness, and it was warmth. She opened her eyes, and the substance touched her face. A dog was licking her cheek. He was a huge, heavy, and quiet creature, standing darkly against the low horizon, and at least two feet higher than the present position of her eyes. Whether Newfoundland, Mastiff, Bloodhound, or what not, it was impossible to say. He seemed to be of too strange and mysterious a nature to belong to any variety among those of popular nomenclature. Being thus assignable to no breed, he was the ideal embodiment of canine greatness, a generalization from what was common to all. Night, in its sad, solemn, and benevolent aspect, apart from its stealthy and cruel side, was personified in this form. Darkness endows the small and ordinary ones among mankind with poetical power, and even the suffering woman threw her idea into figure. In her reclining position she looked up to him, just as in earlier times she had, when standing, looked up to a man. The animal, who was as homeless as she, respectfully withdrew a step or two when the woman moved, and seeing that she did not repulse him, he licked her hand again. A thought moves within her like lightning. Perhaps I can make use of him. I might do it then. She pointed in the direction of Casterbridge, and the dog seemed to misunderstand. He trotted on. Then, finding she could not follow, he came back and whined. The ultimate and saddest singularity of woman's effort and invention was reached when, with a quickened breathing, she rose to a stooping posture, and, resting her two little arms upon the shoulders of the dog, leant firmly thereon, and murmured stimulating words. Whilst she sorrowed in her heart, she cheered with her voice, and what was stranger than that the strong should need encouragement from the weak, was that cheerfulness should be so well stimulated by such utter dejection. Her friend moved forward slowly, and she with small mincing steps moved forward beside him, half her weight being thrown upon the animal. Sometimes she sank as she had sunk from walking erect, from the crutches, from the rails. The dog, who now thoroughly understood her desire and her incapacity, was frantic in his distress on these occasions. He would tug at her dress and run forward. She always called him back, and it was now to be observed that the woman listened for human sounds only to avoid them. It was evident that she had an object in keeping her presence on the road and her forlorn state unknown. Their progress was necessarily very slow. They reached the bottom of the town, and the Casterbridge lamps lay before them like fallen pleiads, as they turned to the left into the dense shade of a deserted avenue of chestnuts, and so skirted the borough. Thus the town was passed, and the goal was reached. On this much-desired spot outside the town rose a picturesque building. Originally it had been a mere case to hold people. The shell had been so thin, so devoid of extrescence, and so closely drawn over the accommodation granted, that the grim character of what was beneath showed through it, as the shape of a body is visible under a winding-sheet. Then nature, as if offended, lent a hand. Masses of ivy grew up completely covering the walls, till the place looked like an abbey, and it was discovered that the view from the front, over the Castlebridge chimneys, was one of the most magnificent in the county. A neighbouring earl once said that he would give up a year's rental to have at his own door the view enjoyed by the inmates from theirs, and very probably the inmates would have given up the view for his year's rental. This stone edifice consisted of a central mass and two wings, whereon stood as sentinels a few slim chimneys, now gurgling sorrowfully to the slow wind. In the wall was a gate, and by the gate a bell-pull formed of a hanging wire. The woman raised herself as high as possible upon her knees, and could just reach the handle. She moved it, and fell forwards in a bowed attitude, her face upon her bosom. It was getting on towards six o'clock, and sounds of movement were to be heard inside the building, which was the haven of rest to this wearied soul. A little door by the large one was opened, and a man appeared inside. He discerned the panting heap of clothes, went back for a light, and came again. He entered a second time, and returned with two women. These lifted the prostrate figure and assisted her in through the doorway. 
The man then closed the door. "'How did she get here?' said one of the women. "'The Lord knows,' said the other. "'There's a dog outside,' murmured the overcome traveller. "'Where is he gone? He helped me.' "'I stoned him away,' said the man. The little procession then moved forward, the man in front bearing the light, the two bony women next supporting between them the small and supple one. Thus they entered the house and disappeared. End of chapter 40